such an honor to have twice in the same year uh, the presence of Alice Water. I don't know if I have words to uh, introduce you, Alice. So uh, you're the next one to be here to present your uh, ideas and your movement. Uh, I think everyone knows Alice. Uh, please, if you can have the stage yep. here. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Do you have presentations? I, wi I oh, wish okay. I had thought about a presentation with slides, but I did not. Um, but you can see I was at Futur. I'm wearing the same shirt <laughs> that I had. <laughs> and it's a very appropriate title for this uh, uh, panel. I feel very close to it because I just wrote a memoir called Coming to My Senses, and the the subtitle was The Making of a Counterculture Cook. And uh, I think probably many of you know my story, but I just want to recap again because it's been very important in my thinking about this very big project that I'm engaged with right now. I went to Paris when I was 19, and I felt like I had never eaten anything before. In fact, I don't, I'm not sure that I did. I was very skinny, and um, I was supposed to be learning French, but I never went to school because it was too intimidating. So I went eating. And the first thing I ate that woke me up was a fraise de bois. I was served a plate of those little berries and a shaker of sugar and a little pitcher of cream, creme fraiche. And I said, what is this? What is this? And I was there for a year. So I traveled around the country, hitchhiking mostly. And so I'd end up in the, in the field sometimes, and an apple grove, and we'd go picking the apples. But I had never even had an oyster. But I had one on the beach in Brittany. And it, and it really awakened me. But it was also about the beauty of the culture of France at that time. It was a slow food culture. People sometimes went to the market twice so they could get something a little bit fresher at the evening market than the morning market. Children came home for two hours to have lunch from school with their families. Uh, People gathered in the afternoon for a drink in the cafe and talking politics. And I, I was just kind of fascinated by the, the discernment around food. We couldn't go to just any little restaurant. We had to look at the menus, see what they had, talk about it. Where did, did the mussels come in today, you know? Or were they here on the menu yesterday? That kind of conversation was very, very important to me. And when I came home, I wanted to live like the French. I knew it had to do with food, but it was about beauty. I was really seduced in an incredible way. I was won over. And so when I returned, I went back to the University of California. I had been involved in the free speech movement and, of course, with the anti-war movement. And it was so hopeful to me because we really felt like we stopped the war in Vietnam. Uh, we all got together and we did this thing. And uh, when Mario Savio spoke, he was the head of this movement, he said, we can change the world. 
we can change the world. We just have to get together and do it. And so we all felt empowered. And I never have lost that, that belief. And so I, I said, well, if this is, uh, I want food, maybe I need to start cooking for myself. And then that's kind of how it happened. And I was lucky to have some great cookbooks from Elizabeth David, who had uh, written so eloquently, uh, MFK Fisher. Strangely, many, many were women that impressed me, people like Mother Joffrey and uh, Diana Kennedy, uncompromising Diana Kennedy from Mexico. And I had an opportunity to meet many of these people. But I, I just said, well, maybe we should start a restaurant. Just la naively as that. <laughs> really naively as that. <laughs> and we didn't know anything. We hadn't been to cooking school. We were in intellectual cooks. We just wanted it to be tasting like the food that we had in France. That's what we wanted. We wanted that aliveness. And we didn't really know how to get it in sort of fast food nation that was in the United States f flourishing at that time in this country. And so we were cooking like we cooked at home. We didn't want to waste anything, so we only had one menu. We still only have one menu downstairs at Chez Panisse. And it changes every night, because we don't write anything down, really. I mean, you learn, of course, over, over these 47 years how to roast a duck best. <laughs> but you don't know what you're going to put with that duck. What time of year is it? What should we make? What's in the market? What's at our farm? So we started to build a network of people to buy from directly, directly from them. So there was no middleman. We had a forager who went out, found a farm, brought the farmers into the restaurant, and then we talked about how we could make an arrangement. And we would, they would eat our food and we would go out to the farm. We ended up, after 10 years, having a network of probably 85 different people during the course of a year. Some we only bought all of their mulberries for two weeks or Maybe it's somebody who provided food on a regular basis, like Bob Kennard, who we became very dependent upon. And we sort of adopted Bob Kennard's farm in Sonoma as our main source of basic ingredients, anything that he could grow on the farm. And at first, we gave him seeds. And now he, he tells what's, us what to serve. So we're eating his weeds. <laughs> we're eating his, his, his uh, nettles. And we make a great pizza out of the nettles. But it's a relationship that we have. And what these people did was bring the values of sustainability into Chez Benny's. We take all the compost back to his farm. And if he sees anything in there that we should have eaten, he pulls it out and sends it back to us. Why didn't you use the ends of these charts? Why didn't you use that lettuce? You know. And so we've had this rapport going for almost 30 years with him. And we really give him the money he needs to do his work. And we have 
the pleasure of this incredibly nourishing food. He said it was 10 times more nutritious than anybody else's. And guess what? I made a joke of that, and he had it tested. <laughs> and it is. It is because he cares so much about the soil. And he is all the time allowing the plants to be all that they can be. With companion planting, it's a little mixture of compost that he puts down. But I knew nothing about his regenerative farming. But we learned so quickly how important the compost was to him. And 25 years ago, and again, I was worried about my child and the world she was going to grow up in. And I said, oh my God, I need to be thinking about education. I had been a Montessori teacher and probably that influence on my life has really been the inspiration for the Edible Schoolyard Project. It is about learning by doing. And if you know about Maria Montessori, she worked 100 years ago in Italy. She was the first female doctor. She had to do all her dissections in the middle of the night because she couldn't be in the room with the men. And she worked in the slums of Naples and India because there were children that were, what she said, sensorily deprived. Sensorily deprived because of hunger and because of poverty. But I just want to say that in this country, particularly, we have been sensorily deprived because of a fast food culture. Most people in this co country, this many, eat fast food. This many, slow food. But this many people are eating a meal in a car, are not sitting at a table, are engaged with a phone or a television screen, are not eating with families anymore. And maybe as many as 85% of the kids in this country don't have one meal with their family. So you can imagine how they're being they're learning the values of fast, cheap, and easy. They're learning that it doesn't matter where food comes from. There's always more. There's always more. That everything should be available 24-7. They're learning that everything should be uniform. And who cares about waste? Somebody else can pick that up. And it is really destroyed the values of this country, the democracy of this country. So I figured that the best way we could make an intervention and a positive one was through the public school system. This is the last truly democratic institution in America and probably around the world. Most every child has to go to school or should. But unfortunately, our schools have been industrialized like our farms. And so it's top down. And we've been teaching kids more is better. And, and as Try to get as much money as you can. And the humanities have disappeared. So when we started this project at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley for a 1,000 middle school children, I thought it was going to be very difficult to win them over. We, I had, though, at the beginning, the whole idea, which was classrooms 
to teach academics. But these classrooms would be the kitchen and the garden. So we taught math and science in the garden, and maybe history, even art in the kitchen. And we would cook with the kids. Maybe we were teaching about the history of Japan or the history of, of uh, the Middle East. And then we would be cooking the food of that place. And maybe it was the civilizations of the Americas, and we made placemats. And we would be eating maybe a tortilla soup, and maybe we would be speaking Spanish or learning what was coming from other countries, but cooking with food that was organic and local. And I know my time is very short here, so I'm going to end with the most important project that I've ever been involved with. And I think it could happen in concert with what everybody is doing here already. And that is to feed every child a free, sustainable school lunch that comes from local farms and ranches and is all organically grown or better than organically grown. We have a very high standard in California and we have a very enlightened group of politicians and I do believe that we are going to be able to do a project in the state of California that, that is going to be part of a delicious revolution because if we could use all of our skills and if we could buy the food directly like we've been doing and many, many, many of you have been doing for a very long time directly from the person. So we give all the money to that person, not to the middleman. So the farmers uh, will do exactly what they did around Chez Panisse. They're going to want to sell it to the school directly. They're going to want to bring it to the school. And we have projects going in many areas of California where this is what's happening. The rancher may say, I want to sell the chicken breasts and the legs at the farmer's market, but I'll give you, I mean, the breasts and the thighs, but I'll give you the legs for the school and the bones so you could make a chicken stock and maybe barbecue that chicken leg for the kids to have. And it benefits both groups. So that's the plan, is that we will provide a sustainable school lunch for all children, kindergarten through 12 years old. But this will be part of the academic curriculum. That's very important that they aren't eating like they're eating in fast food nation, uh, standing up grabbing food at a cafeteria. We're talking about empowering the people in the kitchen of the cafeteria to cook the food for the students. And the students sit at long tables and eat together. And they might be speaking a language while they're, you know, eating their they're Chinese noodles and learning a few words in Chinese from their placemat. But this has been embraced, I'm happy to say, by the most important people in California. It's not public yet, but we have a group of amazing people. And the most important right now of course, is climate. And we have the person who's on the Energy Commission, and he believes that regenerative agriculture can really make a gigantic change.
And so imagine if every school in the state was taking that compost back to a farm, supporting those farms, we might even rebuild a local economy and community. So thank you very much. Thank you.